it, it started in September of uh, 1962. Uh, <laughs> it's just because you're afraid to admit that you know it too, doesn't it? The Jetsons was supposed to be this new space age family of the 21st century. And George Jetson was uh, dad. And uh, he had a job for uh, Cosmo Spacely at Spacely Space Sprockets. Remember that? Yeah. Of course, we never saw what a space sprocket was, but that's where he worked. And in the introduction of the show every week, there was a, it introduced each of the characters. And first was his son, who was, I think he was supposed to be five and a half years old, his, his boy Elroy. And then he had a teenage daughter named uh, Judy. Judy. Elroy wanted to be a scientist, and Judy wanted to be a, um, a, a singer, a performer. She was, she was sure she was going to be a performer. And his wife was Jane, and at least if you believe the introduction to the show, all she did was shop. <laughs> you remember that? When uh, she was about to leave their little spaceship, he'd pull out his wallet and pull a bill out, and she'd grab the wallet. Remember that? <laughs> you remember that? No. Oh, you can admit it. <laughs> One of the things I remember about that show was how easy life was supposed to be here in the 21st century. Like Jane, when she wanted to have a manicure, you know, she didn't need to go to wherever you go to get a manicure these days. She didn't have to do that. She put her hand in this machine in her house and pulled it out and her nails were all trimmed and whatever you do with a manicure and they had nail polish just the color she wanted. and. She'd look, and if she didn't like that color, she'd stick her hand in again and come out, and it would be the right color. And then they also had a, a maid who was a robot named Rosie. And Rosie had to, quote unquote, cook. And cooking was comprised of her pushing a button, and a pill would come out. And she'd serve the family a pill. Remember that? And that was their meal. George. Actually, I guess, although I'm only remembering George, would go for a haircut. But there wasn't a barber or a hairstylist. He went into a machine, and something went over his head, and he came out, and his hair was cut and done. And of course, on the cartoon, every once in a while, it would come out all wrong, and he'd have to go have it done. And there was another machine, and it was sort of like the closet that he went into. And he'd come out all dressed in whatever he wanted for the special occasion. And again, part of the show is he'd come out dressed for work, but it would be like a Halloween costume or something. And, and that was a big problem because the machine was broken down. He'd have to go back, back in. Wouldn't it be nice if change was that easily, be easy? Whether it was the color of your nails for ladies or your hairstyle or your clothes. Wouldn't it be interesting if change could happen that quickly. I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be so wonderful if change could happen that quickly. But in the reading that you shared with us this morning, right at the heart of what it's about is change. For the believers all gathered together on that uh, Pentecost, which was a, a Jewish festival. It was a festival of, of uh, uh, gathering in fruit and vegetables. And uh, it changed. It changed because the Spirit came. And not only did the Holy Spirit come in a special way, but it took this group of people who were all very different, all from different countries. And, and some of the kids who were here from previous confirmation classes may not have realized what I did with this year's class. I didn't make you read the names of the countries they came from. Some of the folks who've read this before had the task of reading uh, Pamphylia and Phrygia and, and Mesopotamia and the outer parts of something. I took that out for you. You can thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> but they came from 
from all over the place and they didn't speak the same languages. But they were all together for this Jewish festival. And so they were together, but they couldn't understand one another. They knew the reason they were all together. It was uh, just a party celebration. It was a religious party for them, but it was a party. And it came time for them to, to be together. And the Spirit came to them, and it changed that party from a group of, you know, 200 people like this who were all different to a group of 200 people who were different, but not the same different, because they could understand what one another was saying. The Spirit brought them together. The Spirit changed things. And that's why we think that this was the beginning of the church. For the Holy Spirit came to give a message. Now, people who were standing on the outside, and we spoke about this when we were practicing last Sunday, thought they were drunk. You know, behaving like that and talking in ways that weren't natural for them, they thought they were drunk. But then Peter comes up and he says, folks, 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 they're not drunk. They're not drunk. What they're doing is just living out what was told of them. It was supposed to happen. And then he quoted the prophet Joel. And he said this new thing, this change, was supposed to come. And one of the things that sticks out for me in that change, and it was part of what uh, Taylor read, he said, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. A lot of us are accustomed to hearing that line, but it takes us a minute to catch really what it's about because young men weren't supposed to see visions. That was supposed to be the realm of the old men because of their wisdom and their age and the experience that they'd had in life. But now Joel is saying, the young men shall see the visions. And the old men were getting toward the end of their life, and they're not supposed to dream dreams, because dreams are supposed to be the thing that is uh, looking to the future, and we know old men don't have a future. <laughs> but Joel said, the old men are going to dream dreams. They're going to have a future. So the young men were going to do what the, the old men were supposed to do, and the old men are going to do what the young men are supposed to do. And it was change. But in the midst of the change was the promise that it was all going to be good. All going to be good. Well, I want to say about the five of you who are joining the church today, being confirmed, that you're about change here for the church. Oh, you've been part of St. John's Church uh, your whole lives. Or a good part of your lives. And it's not like we have five strangers who are coming and joining the church. But what's happening here is that you've made a decision, the five of you, and you said it right at the beginning of our worship service, I have decided to follow Jesus. And what that means, it seems to me, at the very best of of uh, following Jesus is that we're open to change. Uh, you, too. And if you, if you really do this seriously, if you really accept this Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you're really open to what this all means, you're going to change. Not in a bad way, but in a wonderful way to be shaped the way that Christ wants you to be shaped and changed. And so if you change, that means we're going to change. If you're faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to hold your church family again. Oh, but you're only kids. I'm glad, and I heard this this week too, those who went to annual conference, forgive me, I'm going to repeat something we heard at annual conference. Some people say the children and the youth of the future of the church. Bunk. You're the church. You're the church today. You're the church as much as the person who is 90 years old and has been around these parts forever. You're the church. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. You're the church. And if the church listens to this spirit this Holy Spirit who lives within us. And if we follow what that Spirit says, 
If you young men and women have visions, and if through your visions we old men and women can dream dreams, we're going to be changed and we're going to be new and different. The choir sang, come and build the church. I don't know if you caught those words. Come build the church. And said that it's not just a matter of somebody deciding what the church was going to look like, but it's a church that's based on Jesus Christ. Which is different than clubs and organizations that you may be part of or may become part of. It's different than those things that parents and other family members are part of. Those are good things, you know, Kiwanis and, and uh, Eastern Star and Masons and Rotary and Garden Clubs and they're all good things. But they're different than the church because the church is based on Jesus. And, and if we follow that Jesus, we'll be different. So that it isn't just you being kind of unique and changing what you want. It isn't like you being George or Jane Jetson going into a machine and changing by whatever design or whatever buttons you happen to push on the machine. It's you growing growing in love with God and growing in faithfulness to be all that God wants you to be, which is a wonderful thing. So, change. Those folks are going to be watching you for that change. Because now as the church, you'll have a part in it. And now that you're being confirmed, You've made the decision to follow this one who empowers us all and changes all of us. The Jetsons did it pretty easily. I don't know if those machines will ever be invented. I wouldn't put it past us because we have the capability of inventing any foolishness that we want to invent. But I'm confident by faith that you can change into the people, that you can be transformed into the people, that you can grow into the people that the Spirit wants you to be, and you can help St. John's Church be all that Christ wants it to be, too. I asked you to help lead the service this morning, not because I wanted you to perform, not because you're on display in front of your family and friends, that's not what this is about. I uh, ask you to lead worship because it's an important uh, place to be. It's right at the heart of the church, this leadership of worship. This coming to worship is right at the heart of what it means to be the church. And you guys are now at the heart of the church. May that always be for you a good thing. May that always be for you that which makes you stronger. May that always be for you what builds you up in faith and hope. Will everything go smoothly in life because you're a member of the church? No. I'm sorry. Will everything be great and rosy because you have intentionally accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? No, it won't. But by faith you'll have perseverance and strength and courage to face the struggles. By faith you'll have the, the courage to face some of us who haven't yet gotten it. Because the Lord has given you vision that we need to catch. By faith, you'll be able to do things that, that you never thought you could do before. Because you have said yes to the spirit who lives within you. We say we live in a country where any kid can grow up to be anything that she or he wants to be. And, well, for a good part of our culture, that's true. There are still some 
some ceilings there for women or people of color. But for the most part, we can. May you help that to be so in the church as well. And may you experience that as disciples of Jesus Christ in your walk. The Jetsons, they were funny to look at. And it was sort of humorous to imagine what life would be like in the 21st century. And now that we've reached the 21st century, we know it's not that way. Because that was a creation of the imagination of humans. But we don't know what St. John's Church is going to be like. We don't know where you and those who follow you into confirmation will lead us. But we have faith that as you listen to God, you'll lead us well. I'm thankful to God that you've chosen to do this step. That you've chosen to take the uh, adult decision to commit your lives. May that commitment be uh, sacred for you always and for all of those that will walk this journey with you. Amen.